Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor Alberto Bissin. Hello, Professor Bissin. How are you doing? Hi, Lipton. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Alberto. So, Alberto, please refresh our memory. Or should I say, maybe we should refresh your memory and tell us a little about the groundbreaking paper you did nearly uh, over 20 years ago on the transmission of culture. I want to give our readers a background. Yes. So, yes. So I started exactly 20 years ago. It's, it's crazy to think about it. But yes, uh, working with a, a colleague of mine, Thierry Verdier, who was in Paris back then. Uh, he's still in Paris. Um, and we got interested back then. There was very little work in economics on endogenous preferences. Where do preferences come from? Right. So economists are, are you know, uh, very keen on uh, modeling agents maximizing preferences and but but we typically used to take preferences as given so there's a whole there's a small group of people working in many direct in several directions in 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 my case i was a lot inspired by you know i, I had a phd from chicago i was working with gary becker who was doing this kind of work so um on endogenicity of preferences so with Thierry, we basically went back and thought about how people in different disciplines modeled the transmission of cultural traits. And in the end, uh, you know, the very few formal models of this came from um, uh, evolutionary biology. This was uh, Marcus Feldman and Luca Cavallis Forza at Stanford. Um, and then uh, there were other people in uh, anthropology, I would say, uh, Boyd and Richardson, basically. Um, so very little work. Uh, the, the, the models, the dynamic models were a little mechanical. So there was, you know, there was a, uh, the transmission of culture was mechanically modeled. There was a dynamic equation for the, for the, for the dynamics. We thought as economists that we wanted, and this is the, you know, the innovation of our work. We wanted to model parents deciding how much to transfer uh cultural traits to their own kids okay so we modeled this intergenerational transmission as a choice uh, of parents uh, to uh you know uh, socialize their kids to possibly their own or a different one in principle uh cultural traits um in this you know a lot of it was uh, a lot of this work in some sense was motivated by even my experience you know of uh, growing an italian son in in in, in new york uh, in some sense, right? So wanting my son to keep uh, some of the cultural traits of myself, my generation, my family. Um, so we, we were, so that, that's the idea. So we are theorists, so we modeled, basically we wrote down models uh, of, how, uh, of how and what are the determinants of par parental transmission, direct transmission of, of cultural traits. And we came up with models that, um, justified much more than the biology and the cultural anthropology models, basically justified heterogeneity of preferences in the limit. So the whole idea is, you know, the, our models predicted uh, a, a heterogeneity of preferences over, over time and over space, uh, heterogeneity of cultural traits over time and over space, um, much more than these other models would do. And this was important because that's what we observe. We observe, of course, uh very many uh cultural traits uh sustaining over time and over space um and we observe a lot of resilience of cultures which is what we were getting at and alberto what motivates people to transmit cultures is there a competition between groups that are less likely to transmit culture and groups that are more likely to transmit culture? Boyds and Richards in your book, they delve into the issue, but I don't remember the terminology that they employed. And I know that you also touched on the topic in your research. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have a, so the way we think of this, uh, we have a term for it, we call it imperfect empathy. Um, the way we think of it is basically we think of parents who put themselves in the shoes of their kids. So they think they use their own preferences to evaluate the choices of the kids. So parents are altruistic, but with a bias, with a distortion, right? So, um, you know, uh, let's, let's use a, 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 an extreme and trivial example, right? So 
the kid might be happy to, to do drugs, but the parent looks at the kid doing drugs with his own preferences and thinks the kid should not do that, right? So, um, of course, this is, a, this is a, an extreme case, but that's the logic behind it. So we think, you know, the parents, uh, the parents like uh, kids with the same cultural traits they have for many reasons, because they interact better, because they like their own traits, because they're attached to their own traits. At the same time, of course, they evaluate the effect that having this trait uh, can have on the, on the life of the kids. So if uh, being Italian in the US is, uh, is, you know, is, a, is a bad thing for a kid because, I don't know, uh, the labor market discriminates against Italians, then I would want my kid to be Italian, but at the same time, I don't want him to suffer discrimination in the labor market. And then I would socialize him to the Italian trade much less, right? So this is a typical problem that, you know, immigrants um, are facing and have been facing uh, forever, right? So the issue is you want your kid to integrate because you want them to have uh, to whatever the new culture, because you want them to have a, 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 a good economic life or, or a social life. At the same time, you don't want to lose your kid uh, to your own trade because you think, you know, because you like your own trade, because you like to connect with the kids and so on. So that is basically the trade-off, the fundamental trade-off that uh, we model in our work and we see um, in data. I mean, in these 20 years, we've done a lot of modeling, and but we are also work with uh, a lot of co-authors into looking at empirical data on these dimensions, right? And uh Alberto, in your research, you also study the path, the pathways, the path, the pathways by which specific cultural traits are transmitted, like welfare, for example, or welfare traits transmitted. Yeah, a little bit less. We do a little bit less of that, um, and and I, I, yeah, I'm not sure why. I agree, it's an interesting issue. Uh, so we are looking more. When we think about pathways, we really think a little bit more mechanically, right? In terms of, um, for instance, how do you how do you socialize kids? You spend time with them, you take them to whatever, you expose them to your own culture, you send them to schools, uh, which you know impart them with your values. You try and uh, control the social interaction they have, their friends, their kids. You go to church if part of your culture um, as a religious component. So we are more, we are trying to, so, so, so some of the work we've done is to try and understand, uh, though there's a lot more to be done, we really don't have that much of an empirical understanding, but, but, but we're trying to get to understand, you know, which one are the pathways in this sense, the, the techniques, the, the methods that, that parents use to socialize their kids and which one are you know more effective and less effective that's that's um, uh, what we're looking at um yeah and uh, alberto are some cultural traits more amenable to progress than others <laughs> uh so of course we don't like to touch on that uh it's it's a difficult question to touch on right so um i think you know, I, I, I don't know how to answer. I mean, we, we, we are more, in some sense, what we are doing is we, because we are taking the, because we are taking the spotlight from the aggregate the aggregate transmission of traits into the individual transmission of the parents. And we think of the aggregate transmission of a culture as, you know, in some sense, the aggregation over the choices of the parents. We're taking a little bit away, and I, and I like that. Um, we're going a little bit away from the issue of comparing cultures, you see. Um, it's not really about, so to us, cultures are, you know, indexes on a utility function, like economists would say, right? So there are preferences, okay? And we don't get, like economists tend typically like to do, we don't get into the preferences in themselves, into an evaluation, overarching evaluation of preferences. That's, by the way, it's one of the discussion we always had with Gary Becker, who had much more this view 
of, you know, there is some underlying unique preferences that we all have, and then our individual preferences, manifestation of it are somehow technologies of this general preference, um, general overview of preferences. So we are much more uh, detached by this. I think we, we, we deal, the, the whole idea is we model preferences, we take preferences, or the possible preferences as given, and we uh, and we run them. And 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 with this imperfect empathy that I was talking about before, it's a way of saying, you know, it's a way of arguing that parents will transmit their preferences somewhat, not totally, but somewhat independently of the properties of these preferences in terms of achievement, uh, social and economic achievement. It's a little bit, so it, it's detached from this whole, this whole view of, you know, uh, cultural fitness, where, you know, the, the best culture win, uh, uh, whatever that means. Uh, here, the idea is there are cultures and, 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 you know, and yes, there is a trade-off. Yes, as I said, I don't want to, my son to be, Italian, uh, for instance, in some dimension, right? I, I wouldn't want him only to speak Italian in the US because he can't find a job, right? So uh, the, the, there is that dimension, but at the same time, you know, to me, uh, him being Italian is important in itself, in and, of, in and of itself, independent of what Italians mean. It's just that I am Italian and I was raised as such, and I have a bunch of values and I, uh, and preferences, um, and I, you know, like my son to have them too. So uh, we try and be a little bit detached. Now, a lot of the work we're doing right now with Thierry Verdier um, is on the interaction between culture and institution. And there we go more into the issue of, you know, uh, effects on economic growth, right? Because there is where the there it's where culture, the interaction between culture and institution is where um, this, 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 you know, effects on uh, general welfare of a society or a group of people in a society becomes important and, and you know, as, as much more bite. All, all right then, Alberto. Alberto, shed some light on the, the role of the different types of tran transmission so for so for instance the friends of parents do they also transmit culture yes of course uh, peer effects are, are absolutely fundamental in this dimension um absolutely so uh, there's there's a there's a lot of work trying to distinguish uh, uh you know intergenerational transmission and uh peer effects which is much more horizontal right so across uh, people of the same age. And there's an enormous amount of work, some of which we have done, uh, but absolutely you're right. This is, is really very important. Okay, so there are some traits that are much more transmitted. Um, they're much more transmitted through intergenerationally from parents to kids. And there are, tra there are traits which are much more transmitted by uh, the social experience of, of kids, um, you know, in their environment. That's why in a sense, uh, I said before that one of the dimensions, one of the pathways that parents use is control of the social interaction of kids. Where do you send your kids to school? And so in some sense, um, you know, choosing their friends uh, is absolutely fundamental and parents know that. Um, it's absolutely fundamental in determining you know, the cultural traits of your kids. Yes, and we have excellent data for entrepreneurship. The children of entrepreneurs are usually like to become entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, there's, there's many, there's, there's, there's data on, on several dimensions, right? So entrepreneurship, of course, religion, um, political views, uh, and of course, ethnic, uh, ethnic characteristics. But yeah, there's a lot of uh, persistence of culture, of all cultures, um, uh, from parents to kids. Uh, and, and, and I think it's true that uh, kids choosing their own identity, right? So we used to term identity formation for kids. Ch kids choosing their own identity is very important um, in the formation of you know, their own view of the world. But at the same time, as I said, I think it's very important that uh, parents choose their identity indirectly too by, by, by affecting 
who their kids interact with, at least when they're young. Now, Al now Alberto, what is the nexus between economic growth and culture? And again, we have produced some pioneering papers in this regard. Yes. So, as I said before, I don't see a, a direct link that way. Um, I think, I think, um, you know, the, the culture, or, or, or let me put it this way, right? So different cultures determine different institutional, um, um, institutional setups. Um, uh, and I think it's the, in, in a way, you know, I think there's been a lot of work, as you know, in economics nowadays about the effect of institution. I think culture affects institution in a fundamental way. But I think in the end, uh, institutions have a very a much more direct role, in a way, in determining uh, growth. Um, and uh, by institution, I don't mean just political institution. I mean really the way a society is built together and 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 holds up. Um, and and yes, of course, you know if, if you think about cu cultural dimensions like you know. Uh, civic capital or, uh, or human or social capital, uh, yes, those are very important, and uh, and 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 that's in in, in growth. Uh, you know, if you think about, uh, I do, <laughs> I keep going back, but you know, I think a lot about this Italian history, of course, because I know a little bit about it. Um, and you know, there's there's all this data that uh, cities which used to be independent communes in the independent city states. Uh, in the medieval times and the Renaissance uh, still do better nowadays. And that's most probably the effect of the formation of civic capital uh, over history. And then of course these cities now are, are, are um, like Milan, uh, for instance, great example. These cities, of course, now it's not that people from Milan are, you know, uh, the, the, they come so that, the people living now in Milan um, have their ancestors in Milan, but going in, in Milan, in some sense, in a city that has a tradition and cultural trait of this sort has led people to uh, internalize these cultural traits, again, civic capital, and, uh, um, and that has helped uh, the city develop. Uh, sorry, I'm moving a little bit because I'm afraid the battery is going down, but um, we can keep talking, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, we, we what, what did you just say, Alberto? I, I'm moving, I'm moving just because I think uh, I'm losing uh, battery here. Okay. Uh, but I'll be right back, sorry. Yeah, not a problem. Um, so the, po the, point, the point I was trying to make is again, is that, um, uh, is that uh, institutions uh, matter enormously and um, for growth and that culture matters in a fundamental way through uh, institutions um, uh, for growth, uh, much more than you know the individual traits by themselves. Uh, that's uh, sorry, I'm okay now. I just was worried that it would die on us. <laughs> no, you know, you know, Alberto, Zoom can yes. be quite funny at so sometimes. I remember at one point I was literally in a Zoom conversation and the Zoom just disappeared. <laughs> and I just yeah. start over again. But I tell people all the time that the content of the show is intellectually rigorous, but we're also down to earth. If electricity, if the electricity goes away, then we can just start again. I'm I'm down to earth because we don't have control over technology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I find it quite fascinating that when errors are made on the show, people don't seem to comment on the errors. So I interviewed one academic and does sound was was awful the connection was bad and they were expecting people to be up infuriated but they, they didn't seem to care <laughs> they said the content is good they're going to listen to the content but good. Good. alberto i'm someone who like i like economics and i read your work and earlier i said to you are some cultural traits more amenable to economic growth and you didn't want to go down that path, but I read your work and I read people who cite you, and this is the impression that's conveyed. When they <laughs> cite Alberto, they, they use Alberto as evidence that culture is correlated with economic growth. I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, 
I think we get sites, uh, our sites are, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's everything there, but our sites, a lot of our sites are about, I think we, uh, you know, Thierry and I got lucky by the fact that, you know, we have, a, we developed a very simple, uh, very simple, very abstract model about how culture moves, how, uh, about the cultural dynamics. And I think people are using this model because it's easy to use and it's, I think, uh, you know, interesting and, and has relatively deep results. Uh, and so you know, this was the first model in, in economics or in general, in the social sciences, I think with, the, with that dimension, with the economic choices dimension. So people use that now, how, how do they use it? It's not, you know, uh, it's not uh, uh, for me to say. I, I don't, uh, apart from the jokes, I don't know that of much work um, which, which uses our setup or in general, uh, much academic work about um, the effects, you know, the, 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 the understanding qu growth quality of, of culture. I mean, as I said, there's a lot of this, the work of the Rasim Ogle and Jim Robinson, um, it's on institutions. There is some work on culture, uh, on culture as a determinant of growth. Um, and this is, uh, you know, there's some work of ours, but there's work of Guido Tabellini and, and other people. Um, they typically, typically though, when we think about the effects of culture on growth, we think, as I said, of civic capital and, 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 and social capital, right? That's where, that's the dimension that seemed to be important. Then there is some more recent work of people, they might also cite us, um, looking at deeper dimension of preferences um, of culture, like for instance, um, attitudes towards the future, economic discounting, right? So, and that goes back to the entrepreneurship you, you were talking about before, right? So clear that cultures which, um, you know, for, for which the future matter more, that are, that are more patient, uh, will do better in terms of growth. Um, simply because, you know, uh, growth requires uh, avoiding consumption now and uh, to have more consumption later. Growth requires investment of physical capital, human capital, social capital, etc. So uh, I don't know that we that we can do that well, but there is a there's there are clearly attempts nowadays to understand um, to measure or understand uh, the propensity of different cultures in terms of um, the future, in terms of discounting, and also in terms of uh, accepting risks, right? So these are the two characteristics that seem to be very important at a deep level uh, for growth. And so culture that um, that favor uh, risk-taking and favor um, patience, um, of course, uh, might tend to do better in terms of growth. Um, I think this is this is you know certainly in the in the in the models. Um, I don't think we still you know I don't think it's easy to measure this. In particular, when when we try and measure um, uh, risk aversion and discounting um, by ethnic traits, what we find is we find an enormous variability inside each ethnic group uh, in terms of discounting and risk aversion. So the means might be a little bit different, but the variances are huge. Um, so, so it's very hard to, to map uh, cultures into, I mean, different ethnic groups into these traits. Uh, I think it's really very hard. Alberto, I'm going to make a point on femininity and compare to masculinity. So okay. according to several studies, there is a positive relationship between long-term orientation, individualism, and femininity, and entrepreneurship. And people who are not familiar with the research may be a bit surprised, but I'm not surprised because femininity, it, unlike 
masculinity is not a proxy for what some would call a hierarchical culture. So in a masculine culture, people are more likely to defer to le strong leaders, where whereas a feminist culture, where whereas in a feminist culture, people are receptive to a wider variety of ideas. The leadership st structure is a bit less hierarchical. So for those who and for at first sight are surprised. This is the reason why some may find a link between femininity and masculinity. The masculine culture, apparently, according to these studies, is more research, where the feminist culture is flexible. When I when I first saw the literature, I was surprised because we usually can't associate masculinity with dominance and entrepreneurship. But doing more research. I, I was able to gain a better insight into why the conclusion was skewed along a particular line. Yeah, I mean, again, this is um, the way I see these issues, and and you you know your 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 sur surprise is that it's very di difficult um, in general and in this particular case to distinguish once again institution and culture, right? So. Uh, there might be some traits that you refer to as masculinity and femininity, and I'm sure there are, and they're there, but it's hard to distinguish them from the way we structure societies, right? So we don't have many um, uh, societies um, where, where uh, women are on the top of the hierarchical, uh, hierarchical structure. We, for some reason um, developed institution uh, where historically and prehistorically um, uh, men um, which were run hierarchically by men and this affects the development culture but also the, the affects the way we think about femininity and masculinity it's very hard to distinguish um, the trade I, i'm not even sure you can you can distinguish the the, the trade by itself from its manifestation in a general structure of how society is managed. Um, and uh, um, uh, right, so you're surprised that, that um, entrepreneurship uh, might be more associated to femininity, while of course we see very few women or relatively few women uh, entrepreneurs in our society, but that's of course has to do with the way, the with the fact that men are in some way, uh, uh, have been at the top of this kind of a society that we live in for 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 uh, thousands of years, right? So it, it, it's a it's a little hard. I mean, I think this all these attempts are important. Um, they have to be careful. Uh, that's why I try, right? I try to step back a little bit because it's very easy to confuse the various dimension. Of course, there's a you know, there's, a, there's, there's uh, if you go extreme on this, there's the genetic dimension as opposed to the, uh, 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 next to the cultural one, which is, uh, you know, very, 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 there's a lot of interesting work which has been done, but it's really very difficult to do. And one has to be extremely careful. No, it's not a, an issue of political correctness. It's really that you have to be careful because it's really difficult uh, to distinguish these things. And it's then instead very easy to take them um, and run them with, you know, ideologies, prior ideologies and political views. Well, I, I have observed that you're being quite careful in this interview, and that's okay. I don't blame you. We live in a very touchy culture, but I'm not an academic, so I, I only need to point to the evidence. I, I'm, I'm basically, I'm not employed by someone who's going to fire me if I'm controversial. I don't think I'm employed, but I, I don't think I'm going to be fired if I'm controversial either um I, and i'm not trying you know to to bow my head to to a, to a touchy society i'm really trying to be careful because i really think that these things are difficult um and i think we want to go there some of us want to go there some of us don't want to go there um i don't care um i really don't care uh but i think that whatever you do uh you need to be extremely careful because we know so little and we have seen in the past this thing you know take over in ways that are dangerous 
um, and that's why I'm 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 trying to be careful because I because I am careful. It's not that I'm, I want to appear careful. I am careful, and I don't. I, I, I think we're not ready to go that way. Um, I think we're ready to talk about everything. We should, as academic at least. Um, but uh, so I, I don't think as academics, we should, uh, you know, uh, go far or go away, uh, shy away from touchy and difficult issues. Uh, but I don't think we should talk, uh, you know, about them. Um, without uh, pointing out how difficult it is and how little we know about these things. Y yes, and, and, and I do agree with you. One must always be serious and dispassionate, but whenever I have a conversation on culture, I just have to remember David Landes. <laughs> <laughs> David Landes would be having a field day with current research. He would be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> David Landis. I can't just imagine him write, writing his new book. I remember, I remember him in Chicago when I was a graduate student. Yes, <laughs> David was something else. But Alberto, England, because we're on the issue of economic growth and the great divergence, I'm going to mention England for these reasons. Joel Mulcair, in one of his paper, notes that contrary to what is usually said, the English were competent but not overly innovative. They were actually given an advantage because of the apprenticeship system. And I believe that in this paper, you are also listed as the co-author. Aptitudes, that pe that aptitudes, attitudes, and the roots of the great divergence. Yes, uh, as a co-author, I don't know. Oh, or you're, or you're an editor then, you're one of the editors. It's, it's, it's a book and books of historical economics. Yes, I'm one yeah, of the you're, you're, you're yeah. one of the editors. And yeah, I'm yeah. just pointing this out because we usually say, oh, the Industrial Revolution occurred in England because they were inventive. And they were inventive, but an institution cre cre created greater scope for economic growth in England, the apprenticeship system. And it, was, it is also pointed out that even though similar systems existed in other parts of the world world in europe it was a bit in england particularly it was a bit more flexible people had the leverage to work outside of your immediate community yeah 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 uh you know the the, the debate on the root of the industrial revolution are are, are you know are infinite there's there's libraries written about it um now uh Mokir is 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 a uh, is genius really a, yeah a fascinating uh historian and individual is a funny man I, I i i mean funny funny in the sense of you know he bristles intelligence it's it's an amazing guy to talk to uh and he likes to play with this right so he likes to play with the character of the english again uh competent but not inventive i think that's very funny and very interesting so yeah so he is is you know there's a there's a whole there's a whole discussion about what are the cultural traits the, what are the institutional traits what are the physical you know advantages that england had um uh, that all contributed um to the to the industrial revolution by the way one of the issues that we have in this, you know, as academics, and I think this is a mistake we make often, you know, we end up trying to find the cause, the single unitarian cause of things, right? So then you fight, uh, you know, the industrial revolution, is it uh, bourgeoisie culture? Oh no, it's really uh, more liberal institutions. Oh no, it's really uh, whatever the price is, um, uh, price uh, wages that cause so we're trying to find the unique cause and of course we all understand as soon as we step out of our shoes uh, of academics of our own papers we understand that you know it's it's all joint and the, the question should be uh, you know what what how much each one of these factors contributed in a sense if 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 we can estimate that rather than fighting over it's it's really been wages oh no it's really been uh, apprenticeship oh no it's really be uh whatever the inventiveness of of, of english culture right so um all these factors um have a role 
um, and uh, and we don't know enough about the relative the relative importance of this because we typically think of it as it's either this or nothing, right? So the same story with cultural institutions. I mean, again, the stuff that I've been doing, right? So. Um, uh, Darana Semog and Jim Robinson are pushing institutions, and they're by doing that, they in some sense try and reduce the role of culture. And then there's other people who you know push for culture and reduce the role of institution. I don't think we, sh you know, that that particularly relevant, important in any sense. I mean, of I, course I, I, I think it's a complicated issue, but there is obviously an intricate interplay of culture and institutions. So, right, Avner, Avner has a paper on cognitive rules published by the Cambridge Journal of Institutional Economics. And he is contending that institutions are cultivated by cognit cognitive rules, cognitive rules about society, progress, and how the world should work. Yeah, which Hafner is this? Greif? Hafner, G-R-E-I-F, Hafner, Greif, Greif. Greif. Yes. 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 Greif. Yes. 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 He had a paper on cognitive rules. Greif is the, is the father of all this, by the way. Um, yeah, you know, he started working on, he has a several fundamental papers on the role of institutions, uh, starting, he started looking at, uh, you know, uh, uh, Moroccan traders versus Genoese traders. Um, he has a couple of papers on this, which are fundamental. He has, he's been really jointly with, you know, North, uh, Douglas North and others, He's really been the father um, of of the role of, of thinking about the role of institution in growth. Um, really, an amazing, amazing, amazing work is done. Um, so yeah, it should be. Uh, it, economics just get, went a little bit away from formally the way he he was modeling institutions, but uh, still, um, again, he is really one of the of 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 the fathers of this whole. Uh, attempt to understand history, um, uh, to, to, to use this concept, concepts of culture and institution to understand historical dynamics uh, and growth in particular. Yeah, I, I think that we are living in the golden age of economics. And my own view is that the enlightenment can be construed as an institution. And again, I'm following the work of Joel Moker. Yeah. Because the, the Enlightenment was not just an intellectual movement, it had serious consequences for economic growth because Enlightenment thought was incompatible with mercantilism. Yeah, I agree. And the I... en Enlightenment as an institution provided the cognitive rules to support free market institutions. This could be a paper for you to do in the future. <laughs> yes, the Enlightenment as a competitive institution and market for ideas. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is some work along those lines, but yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, Mokir is pushing a lot, right? So this idea that uh, the industrial revolution comes out of this group of intellectual enlightened thinkers um, in in Europe, in England, and of course, but not just in England. Uh, this this community of thinkers, um, and you know, I, I like that. I, I like that take. I think it's important. I think it's absolutely fundamental. I think people see that, by the way, more as culture rather than as institutions. But again, uh, this distinction is difficult, and it's not so obvious that it's uh, that it's important at this level. When you think about history, it's important to uh, define concepts and 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 run with your own definitions, but. Um, uh, before you do the definition at, 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 a, at, a, at the level that we're using them now, right? So chatting about it, it's, it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard to distinguish. Um, but yes, but I think you're right. I think uh, uh, the Enlightenment is culture um, and it is an institutional structure. Again, this community of scholars that Mokir has in mind is certainly an institutional structure that played an important role in the growth of, of, of Europe. Of industrial Revolution, of course, but not just the Industrial Revolution, the, the expansion of the Industrial Revolution to France uh, and other countries in Europe, yeah, Germany. And it could also provide an answer to the dichotomy, to the dichotomy between China and Europe. Again, uh, the, the Landes argument that the Chinese were less revolutionary and found it difficult to accept or unorthodox views. So the institute, the Enlightenment, 
was a transnational institution. Again, Joel Mokir, Europe was politically fragmented. China was un- was was an empire it was united so yeah. due to the competitive forces undergirding the enlightenment as an institution incentives were created to open existing orthodoxies yeah i think that's important i, yeah. I agree with you i think that is fundamental um now once again is it the only cause certainly not but it's certainly important i know very little about chinese culture uh chinese history um, uh, but but yeah, but my reading of uh, secondary reading um, through Mohir, there is also, by the way, a very beautiful, even though le- relatively less well known paper by Guido Tabellini and Avner Greif, um, exactly on the dynamic growth path, uh, comparing the dynamic growth path of Western Europe and China uh, along these lines. Um, and yes, I agree. I think, I think this is very important. I think the attitude, I think competition for ideas, um, is, a, is, a absolutely fundamental in understanding, uh, at least this episode of growth in, 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 in human history, right? So the, the industrial yeah. revolution, let's call it the industrial revolution, the growth of the Western societies. Yeah. On page six, Joel Mukia writes, and it's in the paper, Attitudes and Aptitudes, the paper we discussed earlier, yeah. the yeah. veneration for ancient knowledge has had a distinct dampening effect on the ability of society to experience knowledge process, knowledge progress, since it imposed constraints on what new knowledge was and was not permissible. It created a rigid box, and the thinking outside the box could entail accusations of heresy within the box there could there still could be lively debates and discussions but they yeah. were seriously constrained and china also had a proto enlightenment movement more care likes to comment on it and so did the late nathan Sivin. he has a paper explaining why science did not emerge in china and he contends that in in in, in china science became the Per, per view of the elite and didn't trickle down to the masses. So science did not become a mass-based movement and elites are often skeptical of change. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. These phenomena are important now. Comes to, uh, the one that I know a little bit more is, uh, as, as you were saying, the great divergence, understanding the great divergence. And there also, um, in some sense, the whole issue is uh, the Middle East, so the Great Avengers refers to the Middle East uh, lack of growth with respect to uh, the West. Um, and uh, and there too, uh, one of the, I think, uh, you know, historians tend to agree that one of the fundamental issues are, uh, in, in different ways, but one of the fundamental issues is the fact that uh, pol- the political center looked for legitimacy in, in the clerical, religious clerics. And, and of course, when you do that, what you're doing is you're uh, putting um, typically, uh, co- uh, you know, different cultural views um, in a box uh, because the religious clerics need to, uh, you know, constrain the development of, cultural traits which are which they see as as opposing um, the their own religious view of society and 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 when the the political power relies on the legitimacy of the religious group then of course that's what's happened there are religious prescriptions that limit will tend to limit economic activity I think this phenomenon is is fundamental and what happened in Europe, um, in some sense, it's the opposite, where uh, it was very hard for the Pope uh, to impose um, its own, and, and you know, the, all of the all of the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance. It's about the fight of the Pope uh, to impose its own political power uh, on Europe, uh, with with uh, at the end no success, right? So that 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 the fact that this allowed for uh, freer uh, flow of ideas and, and new uh, development uh, of ideas and, and enlightenment, as you're saying, I think that's important and, and, and true. Alberto, but I guess you should just tell us about your paper on the joint evolution of culture and institutions. 
Yeah, I was planning yeah. to talk about it today. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually surprised that when we decided to digress to talk about Islam, you didn't mention it. Yeah. Um, so that paper, so, so the paper on the joint, on, on, on the joint dynamics of culture institution with Thierry Vertier is, uh, is our attempt to do to the joint cultural institution what we've done to culture, which is to write down a simple model, uh, which is very simple, but very abstract. It's not a model of any culture or of any institution. It's really a model of how, it's a definition of what is culture, a definition of what is institution. Of course, you know, it's one possible definition. It's the one we adopt, but uh, we have a definition of cultural institution. And, and in the context of that definition, we write down a theory of how cultural institution move, uh, their dynamics, independent and interrelated between each other. And the, the reason to write this paper is a little bit, um, the motivation is a little bit what I was saying before, um, which is that we, th we thought that, you know, there's too much work, uh, two things. One is there's too much work in economics, which is purely empirical. Um, and, 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 you know, that's very interesting, but at the same time, uh, looking at empirical data with the, looking at data with the, with the eyes of a, a well-defined theoretical model, it's typically extremely useful. We've seen it in many areas of economics. So that's one of the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to write down a model that people can use and, and, and can use to think about, um, data, historical data in this case in particular. And the second thing we wanted to do again was, um, to write down a model where uh, the two, two important factors for economic growth uh, would interact with each other. Uh, the interaction, we think it's fundamental and we are trying to get away from this, uh, this whole debate and fight, uh, which is about is our institutions the cause of growth or is culture the cause of growth? We think that you know, that discussion makes very little sense. Um, and it's in part motivated by a sort of a very, I don't want to say an obsession, but certainly, you know, a particular, whatever, reliance of economics on causal arguments, on stati causal statistical arguments, and uh, which are great, which is very important that we do that. But uh, we wanted to start thinking about environments where there is no single cause, there may be multiple causal factor which interact with each other and where the interaction in some sense uh, uh, is an important element into the into the into the outcome okay so that's that's what this paper is about then the paper on the muslims the paper on on, on the great divergence in some sense is an application of this kind of uh, way of modeling the dynamics of cultural institutions to try and understand one fundamental historical fact uh, the great divergence that I was saying before, the fact that, uh, you know, from in, in 1000, basically, the Muslim world was economically and socially um, at the same level, possibly far ahead uh, of, of the West. And, you know, now 800 years later, uh, uh, the West was, was so much far, um, uh, so much uh, further uh, economically and socially, right? So, uh, we think that, uh, again, in this case, the interaction between religious culture and religious institution and the rely legitimacy, the reliance of the political power on religious institutions um, is key uh, to understand this, this phenomenon. And, 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 and again, uh, the explanation is the interaction is not, is not culture by itself, it's not institution by itself, it's the way they, the, the, the two interact into generating or into understanding economic and social growth. Alberto, yes. Uh, yeah, when academics come on this show, they're really dispassionate, and I don't have a problem with them being dispassionate. You're quite dispassionate yourself, and this is why I'm irritated when I read stupid articles in mainstream publication imputing political intentions to academics because I've interviewed quite a bit of them. I speak to them via email. And they're quite bland. So when I read an article saying that ex academic is political or a racist, I get upset. Because usually when I invite them, I'm the one who's saying, don't be political, politically 
correct. And this is why I started this show, because I want to engage people to have serious debates. Rigor, rigor is missing in the mainstream media. The New York Times, the Atlantic, and sometimes even the economists, they're all bad. They're always misquoting people and getting into trouble. So these days I only read, I mostly read academic journals. So in Ember, the journal Institutional Economics, I just don't have the patience for, the, for, for mainstream media. But back to institutions. One of the problems with the literature on institutionalism is that it lacks cross-cultural comparison. So for instance, constitutional monarchies, some academics from Africa have done research on constitutional monarchies in Africa. So if you want to really buttress the argument underpinning institutions, we have to compare Europe to other parts of the world. If constitutional monarchies work in Europe, why did they not produce growth in West Africa? Yeah. Uh, you see, we're going back to the, I mean, I don't know enough. Yeah, about, about Africa, yeah. Yeah, I don't know enough about the Africa to actually enter into the substance of this comment. Um, but I, I might be, it might be my own obsession, but I, you know, I see this as a comment about interactions. Uh, it's not that all institutions work in the same way. It's not that all cultures work in the same way. And you know, they are jointly determined and their outcomes of this joint determination um, depends on all sorts of stuff. So, um, I think I think generally it's a mistake to think uh, you know that there are good institutions or bad institutions that there are good cultures and bad cultures. Of course, there are elements of institutions that you know are bad and cannot be conducive to growth, and the same is probably true for cultures. Um, but again, I think you need to understand and 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 think about the whole interaction of the whole environment and see. What was, you know, what of this interaction um, limited growth? Again, uh, we when we think, uh, I'm going back to the Middle East because I, I know a little bit more. Again, I don't want to run away from Africa, but I, I really don't know. Um, I, 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 uh, it, if you think about the Middle East, we think we have identified this dimension of religious legitimacy. We think that's what went bad, okay? Um, in 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 the Middle East went bad in terms of growth. Um, you know there are other dimensions where it could be fantastic, but in terms of growth, we think that that's where uh, things went bad. When you know the 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 religious the religious clerics started blocking um, the the growth or the culture, the ideas coming from the West, you know, the, sto the story of the printing press is crucial, right? So the printing press didn't get into the Middle East in part because it was blocked out, right? So the importance of the printing press in the West, um, we all understand. And so that kind of mechanisms uh, we think we have identified, you know, there might be something else that might be, we might be wrong, but we think we identified exactly the interaction where, you know, a very religious population with, um, very powerful uh, political power linked to very powerful uh, religious power, right? So the very powerful political power has an important role here because typically, uh, we haven't spoken about this, but it's important, so let me mention. So political powers are typically after fiscal capacity, okay? That's in some sense their objective. And uh, for instance, in the Muslim world, um, in the Middle East, uh, fiscal capacity came freely or because due to you know the use of lay soldier and in general the use of the 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 very solid um centralized political power um of of uh the muslim rulers while in the west political power is very much decentralized uh kings are not able uh to increase fiscal capacity and the way they do that is they go to the feudal system um, allowing, uh, conceding power to uh, secular elites. And secular elites have very different objectives than religious elites. Secular elites are after making money um, uh, and, and commercial enterprises, entrepreneurships, and so on. So that is the mechanism. So the power that the, the kings in the West conceded to um, to uh, secular um, elites um, 
in some sense was thrown uh, into favoring uh, commercial and economic growth. Um, the power that uh, was considered too religious elite in the, in the East was used in the opposite way to stop in some sense economic growth, not per se, but because economic growth would, in their view, in the view of the religious clerics, bring uh, with it a sort of you know, weakening of uh, the religious feeling in the population. Um, right? So you, you see what I'm trying to say. So you see the interaction between institution and culture here that plays a crucial role in the explanation. And so I would love to understand somebody uh, you know, to understand, uh, to see people using this setup or this way of thinking or something related to this, to understand um, Africa constitutional. Yes, monarchy. yes, yes. I agree. Uh, like Benin, the, the Benin Empire in history is one of the more influential African empires. So we have better data on Benin. Okay. On Benin foreign relations, and some are arguing that international law originated in Benin, but I think that this is an exaggeration. But yes, okay. the, the, the studies on Benin are quite interesting, and I, I think Benin would be the great case study. When, when, tal when talented academics like yourself appear on the show, I often encourage them to study Africa. I think Africa is the next big frontier in research. I agree. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, we actually went in the book that you were talking about, the, the Handbook of Historical Economics that I edited with Giovanni Federico. We, we, we worked a lot to have, uh, you know, a couple of in Africa. In fact, I think we only have one in the end because some other people were uh, available to write it. But um, we, I agree. Um, there, is, uh, there is quite a lot of work. Uh, nowadays on Africa along these dimensions, but but clearly not enough. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to mention, though, um, you know that you know one of the first uh, and most important uh, academics working on these issues on growth and culture and institution is from Benin, uh, Leonard Wonchek. Yes, yes, I know him. I'm from him. He was he was at NYU. He, he, he lived in my building, um, and my son and his son would play soccer together. Uh, uh, so we were very close for a long time. Then he went to Princeton. He was at NYU. Then he went to Princeton, and I lost a little bit of contact. I see him from time to time. So he would be the guy to do this. Now he's now very much involved in into, you know, uh, developing a school in Benin, so a university in Benin, and it's related. So he's probably less. Um, into active research, but um, he'd be a, a, a person that um, could try and think about uh, this because, you know, again, when you do this kind of, kind of economists tend to do this work, even, you know, applying methods by themselves, but we need historians and we need uh, in people interested or knowledgeable about the history of the environment that we're looking at a lot and we don't do that enough uh, so you know I wouldn't I wouldn't start and and, and work on Africa just because I don't know enough uh, I but, could you, do but you know we can solve the problem quite easily there are people like Professor Leonard you mentioned him earlier but there are also yeah. brilliant men and women in Africa who are doing excellent research so I have oh, read sure. quite compelling research on the guild system in Yoruba. I see. Interesting. Yes. See, there is yes, a lot of interesting research. So I think that elite schools in America like Princeton yeah. and the, the NYU should just employ these scholars. Oh, that would be great. Yes. I, mean, I don't think you know <laughs> enough about them, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. Just, just, just employ these scholars. Some people absolutely. may accuse you of enabling brain drain, but Princeton and NYU have resources and I like research, so employ them. Yeah, yeah, I, you're absolutely right. Yeah, like more. if I, I, I shouldn't say if, it's better to say when, speak directly, but when I get a lot of money, most of it will go into research. I'm very passionate on research. So no, I'm at the seed where I'm investing and saving and building, but when I begin to earn, it's going to go to research. Okay, good. Yes. Good, good. So it was a pleasure speaking to you, Alberto. And pleasure I'm a chatty guy, so I, I can speak on these issues forever. But I'm sure that you're busy. So unfortunately, I have to say bye. But I'm quite loquacious. I could go on and on and on and on. 
it's been very interesting talking to you. Yes, very, bye, very Alberto. Good and to I'm see going you. to get bye Leonard. Bye. I'm going to get Leonard. I want to get Leonard. That's fantastic. So yeah. say hi to him. Yes, I will. All right, bye. Bye-bye.